Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and it's the week of Maker Fair, which means it's a great time for us to meet some incredible makers who have run Kickstarter projects and are showcasing their projects. Now this is Pablo Garcia. You're in town from Chicago, where you're the professor of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, right? That's right, that's right. It's a little bit of a mouthful. It is, it is, but that's the title. But that's what uh, your, your, uh, your focus is on art and history of art? Yes, uh, my, my real interest is kind of this blend of the history of art and history of technology and where those two things kind of coincide. I think we think of like technology as like recent events, but there's been a great history and tradition of art and technology kind of coming together to, to kind of advance art history in, in ways that we couldn't even have imagined. I'm getting chills because that's exactly what we're about. Right. right. The intersection of art and technology, these are not separate things. Never. They are totally intertwined. Yep. And a great way to showcase that is this product that you launched on Kickstarter a couple years ago yep. called the Neo Lucida. That's right. Uh, so for people who may not know what a Lucida is, a camera Lucida is, what is that device? So a camera Lucida or Lucida um, is a 19th century optical drawing aid. And what it was was a prism on an adjustable stand that when you look into it, you were able to see that your subject in front of you ghosted over your page, which meant that you can also see your hand. So what was happening is that the scene was now on your page and you can trace directly from real life. And this was something that is uh, kind of evolved from a variety of different tools like a camera obscura, which most people are more familiar with, kind of mm -hmm. the dark box with a projected image. But mirrors and lenses and, and pinholes and prisms have all been part of these ways to get an image onto your page to draw more realistically and more accurately. Um, and the camera lucida was, was just an early 19th century. So how did people use it and when did it first pop up? Was it a consumer device? Was it an art to artist tool? Uh, you have several devices here that yeah. you've brought that seem to be like from that era. Yes, so um, the original one was, unlike the camera obscura, which is kind of like an ancient knowledge about just, oh, a pinhole creates this effect. This has, a, uh, has an actual just original beginning, like William Hyde Wollaston, who was a chemist, a Scottish chemist, in 1807 uh, designed a camera lucida um, and he named it too, kind of a play on the name Camera Obscura, that instead mm -hmm. of a dark room, right, Camera oh, Obscura, right. this yes. is a light yes. room. Okay. Um, and what it is is just a kind of a uh, small prism, and that prism is basically a beam splitter. So when you look down at the edge of the prism, part of your vision goes to the page, part of the vision kind of bounces twice inside the prism and looks out, and you kind of, your eye, your brain kind of puts the two together. And because the image is bouncing twice in there, it's not backwards or upside down. Yeah, part of it makes me think of like, DSLRs, camera technology, exactly. the prism inside that flips that lets you see what right. the lens is seeing and also maybe the reverse way of like how a, an old school classroom projector works except as opposed to projecting the image, the image is coming to you right. in, on the paper. And that's similar effect and what he did when he invented it, I'm, I, I'm not 100% clear like what his total goal was but what happened was very quickly artists, remember you know an artist is a professional maker, right? So they want to get commissions, they want to do work better, faster, and so a tool like this helped them very quickly kind of outline beautiful drawings. But also scientists, if you were into natural sciences or archaeology, right? So um, if you were going on, a, on an expedition and examining the ruins of whatever, you would want to draw accurately this kind of scene to bring it back. Because remember, this is in the days before photography was invented. Right. So, so you people, imagine when you look at like the taxonomy of plants, or right. something, and you see these beautiful sketchbooks. A lot of that's directly from the eye. Right. But if there's a tool like this, which you can put in your expedition bag, right. that you can set up and clamp on a, right. on a, on a stick or anything, yeah. you can get a really great representation drawn on the page. Exactly, and without photography, I mean, put yourself in the mindset of the days before photography. How do you draw more accurately? How do you convince someone that this is an accurate rendering of what you discovered or what you're studying or what you're seeing in real life? Um, in fact, uh, one example is when Audubon was reducing the elephant folio Birds in America to a smaller consumer grade version, he had his son use one of these tools to actually make reproduction miniatures of his drawings. So you can also use it as a copy stand. It's photocopier. Yeah. Right. And so the tool is very versatile for a lot of different uses. And even after photography was invented and took hold, the tool evolved into something that was able to be used for um, engraving and other kind of copying products. Uh, services that that professional engravers would do or you know the days before photography was easily disseminated 
But and that's not to say there is no artistry in the drawing. Oh no! Even yeah. though you can see the image and you're tracing with with light, right. uh, you're also you still have to understand relationships between these shapes and forms. Yeah. And you're still using your hand, holding right. a writing tool and drawing tool. It's just a different tool. Right. And this is part of the controversy that part of what inspired my interest in the tools in camera lucidus was that when David Hockney produced the book called Secret Knowledge, in which yes. he kind of talked a lot about the way that ancient masters probably used optical tools, whether it was camera obscura mm -hmm. or mirrors, and there's a whole bunch of versions of that. But he mentions specifically the camera lucida. And he talks about uh, Jean-Auguste Dominique Angre, who has these kind of beautiful pencil portraits from the early 1800s. And it was controversial because certain people just want to believe that these things are naturally just super Genius, super they're heroes. Savants. Exactly. But the reality is the tools are still hard to use. They yeah. just, they, they guide the hand, but it's still actually very challenging to use. Yeah, we'd like to think of tools as, you can do, you don't need the tool to do everything, but the tool right. expedites the time and allows you to bring other creative forces in right. to make your art. Right, and what I found also, like certain tools allow for the automation of some part of the task that you're doing so mm. that you can focus on the other part. So if I'm looking at you to draw you, I don't have to like look up and down, the image yeah. is there. So proportion becomes a little easier, but I'm still focusing on how I'm drawing. You're shading. Right? This is the way I'm shading. The color. My hand becomes more of my focus, not so much trying to do too many things at once. Oh, that's very yeah. cool. Now, in addition to one of these original camera lucidas, uh, you said photography came about obviously over 100 years ago. Did we see a decline in the use of these once you know, digital photography, even, even traditional photochemical photography uh, became more widely used? Yeah, so, so the, the history of the camera lucid is actually really funny because in like 1807 it's invented and becomes a popular tool. Um, quite expensive tools kind of for the high level hobbyist and we, there are some kind of amazing artists that we know who use them, scientists as well. So Sir John Herschel, the astronomer, used to carry one around with him, did beautiful drawings as he's traveling around the world, setting up observatories for king and country and all that kind of thing. Um, the, the funny story though is that uh, part of the decline of the use of this tool, or at least the knowledge of this tool, had to do with photography. And it mm. turns out that Sir John Herschel, he would go on holiday with his good friends, as one did when you were part of the British gentry. Um, and so one of his friends was very frustrated by the fact that he would look in this prism and see a beautiful image right there on the page, and then he would draw, and then when he looked away, the drawing was kind of like, uh, it didn't live up to it. And he said, I only wish there was a way to take that image inside there and put it on paper. And that friend of Herschel's was Henry Fox Talbot, who wow. invented photography. Yeah. So his inspiration for photography actually came from using the tool and wishing that the image inside the tool could actually just be fixed on paper permanently. So weirdly, his experience with this tool led to the decline of the tool because he was able to create this chemical invention that is photography. It's the age but, of photographic reproduction right. and yeah. But, but the, the, weirdly the tool existed in different forms uh, pretty consistently since the early 19th century. Yeah, let's put so, it up on here. Yeah, so, love to see so like, like this version, for example, is from around 1900. It's a different prism design um, and with all these different little lens attachments. Uh, and this was actually more of an engraving copy tool. So uh, while photography was popular, uh, photographic reproduction for magazines and newspapers was still a challenge, like photogravure was not really, you know, like transferring pho photographic images in print was hard. So what people would do is you would go do your glass plate photo, you would bring it back, and then a copier would kind of make an engraving out of your photograph mm -hmm. uh, for reproduction. So that's, that's a tool like this. What, what would the different lenses do? So the different lenses actually adjust the focal length. So at one of the kind of the number one lens, for example, will do kind of distances and then the number 12, which you can see is kind of this fat biconvex lens, you can enlarge a postage stamp, right? Ah, so these are okay. like, this is more of a kind of uh, professional engraver's tool, but still exactly the same premise. And this is the first vintage one that I ever bought. And I used to use it for landscapes and portraits and still lives, just like any other one. Um, and then you still have the interest of it into the 20th century. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is the 1954 Magic Art Reproducer. Um, and you can see the oh, box. Yeah. It says, you know, draw the first day, yeah. no lessons, no talent, right? And it's got the young man kind of drawing the beautiful like swimsuit yeah, model, right? Yeah. Um, and this was sold in like pulp magazines as an inexpensive toy. Yeah, the back and, of a Boy's Life magazine or something. Exactly, and you would find it next to like the x-ray glasses yes. and those kind of silly things. But as you can see, it's a really simple, it's just an angled piece of glass and a mirror in the back. And when you look down, it does the same thing. 
really poor image quality compared to the prism of the original design, but at what was around $1.98 in the 50s, a bargain. Yeah. Right? Um, but it, of course, it's aimed kind of at a kind of uh, commercial desire to kind of like, oh, I can do a cool trick or something like that. And then 50 years later, <laughs> Right, you've decided to take on this concept of the Lucida and make the Neo Lucida, which That's right. was your first Kickstarter project. It's right. the one mounted here. Yeah. Um, and talk about the development of this, because the, the concepts are well understood, but yeah. there's still a lot in the product design and the optical systems, the prison right. designs. You know, you didn't come from a manufacturing background, I right. assume. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm trained as a designer, an architect, and an artist now, um, and this came about because of David Hockney, again. So the book was this kind of inspirational moment that uh, some colleagues of mine and I kind of in the design art world were just talking about in an educational background, boy, this is an amazing piece of research because it did a lot of firsthand experimenting. Like mm -hmm. Hockney would set up drawing experiments, much as like the film Tim's Vermeer, in which yes. you see someone go through these extraordinary steps of recreating an, a dead piece of technology. Um, and so uh, a fellow artist, Golan Levin, and I were having this conversation and I said, oh, here's some of my camera lucidus. And we had this conversation about, wouldn't this be great if our students could kind of see this stuff firsthand? But of course, you know, these beautifully crafted uh, brass objects are hundreds of dollars on eBay and they're pretty much obsolete. So we had the problem of people hadn't heard of it. And if you had, acquiring one was just way out of range for most people. Yeah. And we said, well, what is the technology? And you know, in the end, it's this little tiny prism, right? And this is our manufactured version. Um, and all it is is just, I just measured off of some of the old ones and kind of worked with the factory to kind of test some out. It's a very simple technology, but what we did was instead of all of these kind of insane parts, which make this a very expensive, difficult tool, um, we just used kind of a gooseneck and an uh, anodized aluminum CNC'd head, put the prism gently in there, and a little clamp, and it makes it a much easier tool to acquire. Um, and what we did was we said, well, this is going to be about like $15,000 to raise the money to do the minimum order. Uh, and we're like, well, are there enough art history and tech history <laughs> nerds out there? Um, yes. <laughs> and the funny thing was, um, it took off very quickly and we had over 11,000 backers because I think it inspired a lot of interest in, yeah, I want to draw, I love to draw, this sounds like a way to get into drawing. Yeah. Um, and that was a big surprise to us, but a really like fantastic moment to kind of talk about art history, technology history, but also what it is to kind of take pencil to paper and, and as, as professors, the idea that pe more people will be inspired to try something new, that was a real great moment. Yeah, and connects artists, aspiring artists, students with these the same principles and practices as artists several hundred years ago, right. and also works as a real skill building tool. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's a functional tool. It's not just a kind of science demo. Mm -hmm. um, it works just as the original ones would have worked. And in fact, we argue that because these are made with modern glass and modern mirror, modern technology, they're actually sharper and cleaner and better. Um, most of these older ones have like micro abrasions after a hundred years of use that ours is actually a brighter, better version than what you get for a fraction of the price. Well, a couple years later now, since your new Lucida, you're launching a new Kickstarter. I believe it's going on right now. It is live, the absolutely. The XL version. We have it off camera. Let's bring it on right. and take a look at that. This is the new Lucida XL. Right. Uh, I can tell it actually looks more like the old vintage tool than uh, your first version. Right. So what happened was because we were aiming at kind of authenticity of history with the original, um, a lot of people were interested in it as a drawing tool. But of course, our thesis was, well, look, it's actually not cheating because it's actually hard to use. And so many people reacted saying, I got the new Lucida, looks great, it's hard to use. Mm -hmm. And we said, well, yeah, we know. I mean, that's kind of part of the challenge. But I found that with so many people really inspired to draw, I thought, well, is there a way to do something that could make it a little bit easier. And there is the history of it, right? So we have like the magic art reproducer is glass and mirror. Um, and I also have this other vintage piece from 1840, also glass and mirror, but made with kind of the brass beauty of the kind of 19th century technology. So there is historical precedent for a different optical design. That instead of a, instead of a prism, it has a piece of angled glass, which is partially silvered, and then a mirror in the back. And so when you look down into it, 
you know, I don't know if it helps to see this, but um, your vision, instead of being split by a prism, part of your vision just looks straight through the glass, part of it bounces off the glass, bounces off the mirror, and sees the subject. Mm. And so the image quality is a little bit different, but it's exactly the same premise, and the beauty of it is you're not looking and fussing in this tiny prism. You just look in the hole, and the image is there. Um, and the big test was that I have two young daughters, and when I made the first prototype, my oldest daughter was seven, and she could never use the new Lucida, the original, because it's just too difficult. And she looked right inside there and she said, oh wow, there it is, I see it. And she was like drawing her teddy bear. Yeah. So I think it's, um, it's a kind of companion piece, a historical companion piece to the original, because it's different optical design, same contemporary design of, of the new Lucida, um, and offers a very different drawing experience, but the same premise, you can draw, you can trace directly from real life. Now with this particular configuration, and I know this is your prototype, is there, like, the parameters are kind of locked in for the best distance, the size of objects, what are those that, you're, that you've targeted? So one of the things actually with the prism version is that if objects were too close, the optics start to fail. With this one, because it is just glass and mirror, it's not lens, so there's no focal length really. So you can draw anything at any distance mm. effectively. Um, the weird thing is actually it's it, the, the size of your drawing and the si scale of your object have to do with placement. So if I were to draw you, I can kind of set it up, you know, sit you down on a stool, look down on my page and I'll say, you know what, this drawing's a little small. Well, I just need to raise it up and it would make the image look a little bigger. That's or, distance from the sit to page. Right. Uh, or if I want more detail, I could just move it closer to you, right? right? And so there's no kind of camera focal length in which like there's a kind of minimum focal distance of a yes. camera lens. This doesn't have that. Um, and with the original one, we even showed on our website like a hack where you could take like magnifying glass and some binder clips and like stick it in front if you wanted to mess with that. Um, so there's, there's very little limit. In fact, the only limit to drawing with this, we joke, is like it's the length of your arm. Because you can always clamp this to like a tripod or a shelf and draw much farther. Um, and I even have this like novelty pencil that's this long and I show people like you can technically draw very large It's just you have to get comfortable with like drawing at that distance So you can kind of focus or at least compose on your page based on where you place the object So it's definitely not a kind of quick sketching tool. It's more like setting it up it's Portrait still life landscape and then you're ready to draw. Did you have to also experiment with how the clarity of the image, how much you wanted to see the image versus your page, yeah. um, how much that diffuses color, what lighting environments you have? Like, what are those optical uh, optimal scenarios? Yeah. So the the beauty of the original prism design was that it managed to compensate for different lighting scenarios really, really well. Like if you're, if the scene was very bright and the page was a little dim, it would still work because your eye was kind of doing some of the work. In this case, because you're looking through the glass, lighting differences can make a difference. And so um, optimally lighting is just kind of general and ambient even. If it's something's too bright, I mean think like a camera, right? If you're photographing you with a bright window behind, there's gonna be exposure issues. Similar thing here, but um, unlike the original Neil Cedar, what we've done is we've also added this uh, shader, mm. um, and it's stored in the back. And essentially, uh, if you if you look down, you say, "Oh, it, you know, it's, the image is really faint here." I can take the shader out, place it underneath, and it shades the page, so it kind of becomes a bit of like a neutral density filter to compensate. If it's the opposite, and like the scene is too bright, um, you can place it in front. Ah. So you can basically kind of do at least one. Uh, it's not truly one stop, but if you were a photographer, treat it like, oh, I can make a stop difference by, by altering the lighting of each piece. Um, it's kind of a necessary uh, component to the piece because the, sil the partially mirrored glass does, can, can quickly kind of make the image disappear depending on your page. Um, the other nice thing is that you can control the lighting of the scene. Right? So you can turn on a light to kind of illuminate your subject more. Also, you can use different color paper. Yeah. So if the paper is white, it might brightly be too bright. If you use buff, tan, or gray paper, which a lot of artists like to do, so you can do highlights, you do that as well. So there's a few different ways to control lighting um, with the uh, elements here, but also with the control of the environment. Awesome. Well, that's great. I love that it's taking the original idea. You didn't just do one and done. It's taking to a whole new level. And it's because of the feedback, because the first Kickstarter was so successful and people said they wanted to use this to actually learn to draw. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm not a great artist. I am terrible at drawing. That's but fine. That's perfect. <laughs> I would love to get my hands on and do a demo of this. I sure. think we'll grab something from our office 
to see if I can use the Neo Lucid XL and create a, a portrait of something we have. Yeah, and again, one of the things that I uh, really reinforce is like, it's not a shortcut to becoming a great artist, but it may just make you a little more confident in drawing or make you a little less frustrated to get started. All right, well, so let's, let's get started and give it a try. Yeah. Thank you.